secrets of the kingdom of heaven, that we may know and understand what your plan is for us, that we may know and understand what your purpose is for us, that we may execute it in this earth realm. Lord, we pray for an a, a expedited measure of dominion to return to the church, that we may walk in the ways that you've called us to from all the same dominion mandate that you've given to Adam, the same dominion mandate that Christ came and took back for the kingdom. Let us be set apart ones. Let us stand in the position of your body that we will be a light set up on the hill, not put under a bed, that we, that we may live as righteous ones, as your word declares, that we will live according to the word, not the ways of darkness. Jesus said that I've come and none of the enemy is in me. Lord, skirt the balance and, and transform us from one, wanting to conform to the ways of the war, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The renewing of our mind that we may walk and stand and have your precepts in our heart to know you truly. That we're not seeking ambitious gain, but to understand we have the very source and foundation, the foundational creator you have put the world on its, its axis, and we have access to you. Let us lean now in that, in you, and in your scripture, that we may pull out the true richness that you have provided for us. For the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us here and now. Impact us globally by this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So anointed, Pastor. Just bless the Lord for you and and Pastor Sheba being with us, Pastor Titus. And um, I must admit and solicit, first of all, admit that I am uh, in the strength of the Lord today. I am very weak in my physical body and in my spirit. Um, and so the Holy Ghost is empowering me to be here today. Um, I personally didn't want to be here today, but I have learned in maturity of the Lord to do his will, even when I am pressed out and don't feel like I can do it. And I glory in my infirmities because it is at that point, the power of God rests on you in the most profound way. And I solicit your prayers because, uh, you know, the enemy is angry at this ministry. He is extremely aggravated by me. We're old enemies, arch, arch enemies, I might add. And uh, Satan has met me on the battlefield in many different places over 30 years. And he is deeply angry. He is deeply angry. Now, so I solicit your prayers because the last two to three weeks consecutively, the ministry and my personal household has received an attack from his kingdom. And I don't mean the play version either. So he's going for the throat, but he can't get his hand around my throat because I'm a praying man and I know what the Holy Ghost um, has uh, invested in me to do. And I know that I have power over all his forces, so I'm not concerned about these attacks, but I do want to solicit your prayers uh, for the First Lady, for myself. She's on assignment today. So she can't be with us. Um, she's going to support one of our other prophetesses here in Texas. All the uh, many of the areas uh, leaders are coming together in Waco, uh, in particular the lady. So she's going uh, in that group to support one of uh, the fine prophetesses here. But she's actually a pastor too, but extreme um, prophetic gift. Um, and her husband anointed, you know, and uh, like-minded individuals. So just solicit your prayers for her and travel and and things of that nature. And um, so I solicit your prayers because the enemy, the enemy is angry. He is, he, and I'm not talking about the play version either. Now, Pastor Titus, I want to share with 
and this is not going to be the conventional way nor did i there's a verse great versatility in my spirit i don't particularly have to minister a particular way so today is not going to be the normal but the fire of the holy ghost is burning in me and so i'm in the fire power of the holy ghost but i i i saw before we came to this day uh a more of a of a um kind of fathering anointing where the holy ghost has to speak to us about very grave and serious matters but more of the behind the scenes and in the details of of how we're serving and leadership so this past week in kenya over the past week maybe a little more two pastors have come up there okay and i want us to hear i want us to hear this carefully because this will come to america at some point because the people who are perpetrating this are getting on airplanes and it it will come to our shore it's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when and it will be shocking to the american mind because we have hybrid prophets that i've warned of we have hybrid prophets uh, it's a series that we have been doing on on our sunday morning uh worship gathering um it's three parts it's up there for everybody but it's a warning against what's getting ready to happen this past week two pastors um arrested along with their I don't know if you want to call them elders. One reporter called them henchmen. Um, there was a pastor who was teaching that you want to go to Jesus right now. I, I, oh, please hear me carefully because we we just, <laughs> we're, we're, our eyes are not as open as they need to be in the realm of the spirit, but the Lord is doing his best to warn us down here. And he literally said, this is his doctrine, that the way, and he's using scriptures like, as I alluded to earlier, for us to live as Christ, for us to die is gain. So we want to go be with the Lord right now. And many of you, many of us are old enough to remember the Heaven's Gate cult, okay, in California, where the bald-headed white gentleman told everybody, hey, we're going to Haley's Comment. We got to go be with the Lord right now. Everybody drank poison. He pulled the Jim Jones on him. Jim Jones, you remember back in the 60s and 70s, did the same thing on an island, killed several hundred people. Well, here's a pastor that did it, but he convinced all these people to starve themselves to death. So the body count is over 100 right now that they're dig digging up. These people are buried. Seven family members in one grave, including several children. So what they did was split the compound. The parents are over here. They convinced them by demonic spirits to starve themselves to death, to go be with Jesus immediately. The children are on another side of the compound and they're starving the children and they got them separated. So the natural instinct of the parent to jump and save the child doesn't kick in. Over a hundred people they've brought up now. And this guy's name is Paul McKenzie. Okay, the first pass. The second one, his name is Ezekiel something. And yes. he, so you know what I'm referring to, Pastor Titus? Yeah, I know them. I know them, two of them. Okay, so that kind of measure will come to the United States. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Because hybrid prophets are breaching our borders. They're already in the pulpit. You're watching them on YouTube. You just don't know it. Many people don't know it. Many do, many don't. Unfortunately, the problem for the ones that don't, you're probably going to be the victims. You're probably going to be the victims. We have churches in Texas right now, they're suspecting of these kind of measures. The problem with these hybrid prophets is they are so very difficult, and the Lord, the Lord shared this with me, they are so very difficult to detect because you can see it in their preaching but some of them their preaching is so airtight that you can't even see it there okay and um but it is it is already breached our shores these kind of prophets are already here in america okay and eventually we will have incidents like this it, it is coming 
So we, and, and what it is, <clears throat> is judgment has come upon the nations of the world. But in particular, and hear me carefully, because Kenya is one of these nations, and I warned in a message entitled, uh, A Message to Four Kings of Africa, I warned that if the sons of America and the sons of Africa didn't begin to work together, and what that means is us prophesying the word of the Lord from our pulpits. This is why I asked the question before, what was it, who was out there with Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones? Humanly speaking, who was out there with him when he was prophesying? Because I was trying to point all of us leaders to, so many times we think if nobody shows up to the church, if nobody that the Lord isn't telling you to prophesy concerning whoever's sitting in front of you. He's telling you to prophesy from the bedroom of your home, from the living room of your home. When you speak into the air by the unction of the Holy Ghost and the prophetic anointing, oh, please hear the Holy Ghost carefully. The angels of heaven begin to descend and fight with you and for you on your behalf. They come right alongside of you. And whether it's in the heavenlies or in the earth realm, they begin to fight on our behalf to establish in our area. See, many people calling themselves prophets. I'm not going to argue with you because if you're not the Lord, the Satan will wipe you out. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And many prophets, they come and they're teaching and preaching, but their home is completely desolate. Their lives are desolate. They're alone bitter, dried up, children gone, husband gone, wife gone. Now we have more widowers than I've ever seen widows. It's more men now where the wives are going, okay, which is a new phenomenon in America. That's new to us. It was always more women than men. Now it's starting to even out because more women are leaving. Why? Because they, so we want equal rights, get up in the workplace where you're taking now on you the, the spirit of death in that. You work, you die. <laughs> work brings you to death if you don't manage it. So the men are in there struggling, trying to make a living, and the women are at home, give me, give me, give me, no praying, and the men die. You're going to be by yourself. So you know what I've been calling on all the, the ladies to do? Teach your wives, especially your young ones, to pray for their husbands. You don't want to be alone. And see, here's the sad part. What happens to us when you're a widower or a widow, you have to be careful. Or let, let's not, if, if you're alone, okay, whether your spouse is living or not, or you never had a spouse, you just are shacking up, but that person leaves, okay? And, and, and first of all, let me state in the body of Christ, we're not supposed to be shacking preachers. Please stop teaching this across the pulpits. You're not supposed to have a boyfriend and girlfriend that you live with. That's not acceptable by the word of God. That's fornication. So having boyfriend and girlfriends, I don't teach that. I teach the old time way, courting. Let's get to know each other. Start there. Let's get to know each other because you will find out if you get to know somebody and you keep sex out of it and you keep all the physical touch out of it and you keep it platonic, you will really get to learn them and you might find out in the first five, 10 minutes, you don't want nothing to do with them. You, you don't want nothing to do with them because the Holy Ghost will have an opportunity to be able to lead and guide you. So, I, I don't teach that, and we need to stop teaching that. That's a side note, okay? We need to teach you have to court, get to know this person. You should have pastors that can be involved, involved and pray with you, okay? This is why we're losing our churches, because there's no tight protocol. No one has to go through anything. No one has to suffer. Well, I'm suffering because my flesh is hot. Put it down in prayer. 
Go through this and let the Holy Ghost process you and let him show you if this is your husband or your wife and then go and marry them through the proper protocols. We've lost this now. You know why the Lord put us in the protocol of COVID as the church? Because the churches were completely out of order. They're not benefiting anybody. What were they benefiting anybody? Not benefiting a single person because the people have overtaken them. The pastors teach and preach according to what the people want. Not according to what the Holy Ghost is telling you. So the churches are useless. It's a hard truth, but I'm going to tell it here today. We're recording, so this is going to be people are going to hear this. The churches had become completely useless. No one's being challenged on their sin. No one's being, and first of all, if you come on the other side of the cross talking about all sin has left you, I'll tell you what hasn't left you is the ability to do it. And that's why you need a good dose of preaching that, re that doesn't remind you of your sin, but reminds you not to sin. Bishop, that can't be in my Bible. First John, the second chapter. Beloved, I write unto you that you sin not. That you sin not. He's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. I write unto you that you sin not. He's not reminding them of their past sins. He is teaching them to not sin going forward. So you know what the people calls the pastors to repent? Don't judge me. We're not. But we are judging. We are giving you the protocol that will judge you. Bishop, where's that? My Bible. The Lord said while he was standing on the earth, the Lord Jesus said, in the day of judgment, I'm not going to judge you, but you have one that's going to judge you. And who did he say that was? He said the word that I've spoken to you. Your word, pastors, our word from the pulpit is going to judge people, not you, but the word coming out of your mouth. Because if the Holy Ghost is in you, that word is coming from the master. You don't have to worry about you judging anybody. The words you're speaking will do it for you. Because it will do it for the master. It's not personal. The reason we can't a lot of times preach what we're supposed to is because we're making it personal. It's not personal. I tell people all the time, if something came out of my mouth, convict you down to your socks. It's not personal between me and you, but it is kingdom personal. It's personal between you and the king you say you serve. And you will see that word again. That was the point of him giving it. So, no. We're not condemning anyone, judgment, to adjudicate you to heaven or hell. The Lord didn't give us that adjudication, but he did give us the judgment of discernment of what? Your fruit, the way you live. I know you're in the club on Friday night and in church on Sunday. Bishop, you don't know that. I absolutely do because I drive all these millennials to the club every weekend trying to minister to them and you would think many of them would turn and some do but the majority don't but then they'll sit right there get out the car uh sir the lord bless you i'm already blessed but you're gonna need a blessing not too many days from now because that kind of hop straddle in the fence disobedience you got you're gonna find yourself in a forcible measure my life, the fact you got in my car and you hear worship music playing, the fact that you discerned that I may be someone at church at the minimum, I could be a holy man at maximum, the fact that you got a little bit of discernment, you already judged yourself. You judged yourself. See, we have gotten away. You know, it's not us judging people. You have judged yourself. Bishop, is that in my Bible? It absolutely is. Right between Matthew, the seventh chapter and the 10th chapter, somewhere in there, the Lord told the disciples, when you go into a city or a house, when you go into a city or a house, I'm trying to keep the preacher on the bench now. When you go to in a city to, uh, to a city or a house, inquire 
who in that city is what? Worthy. And you lodge with them. They have judged themselves worthy. Worthy of what? The presence of the Lord in his servants. Mm -hmm. And he says, let your peace, let your peace be upon that household. I go in people's household all the time. I come to many places all the time. And people always remark, you know, it's uh, people come, if they come to my house, no matter where I've ever lived, I don't know what it is, Bishop, whenever I come in your office to your house, whatever, just peace comes over me. Years ago, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to work a work in you. And I, I, my, my daughter calls me Papa. She doesn't call me dad or daddy, or she calls me Papa. And I thought it was unusual until one day the Lord came to me in my office at the time. And my first pastor, he spoke to me. He said, I, I put this in her spirit to call you that because Papa, that P-O-P -P is patriarch of peace. I'm going to make you a father of peace that whenever anybody crosses your path, extreme peace sets in on them. Most people today, they need peace that comes from the Lord that passes all under. I'm calm and don't even know why. Shouldn't be with everything that's going. I shouldn't even be as calm as I am right now with the attacks Satan's been leveling at the ministry. But I'm calm because I know it's in the hands of the Lord. I know it's in his hands because I put it there. I put it there. That's how I know it's there because I put it there. Let your peace, and it says, but if they judge themselves unworthy, if they if they just, we, we don't want it, he says, you take your peace back, you retract your peace, shake the dust off your feet against that city or that home. He says, it'll be worse for them in the day of judgment than for Sodom and Gomorrah. That's in your Bible. It's in our Bibles. But you know what happens? We're run, I, and I don't understand. Why are we running around complaining about what people are doing? We know what they do. Oh, they're attacking the Lord's anointed. You don't even have to address it because they've already judged themselves unworthy. Just let the judgment process of the Lord overtake their lives. When I see people do that as it relates to me, Shaking the dust off your feet is simply just acknowledging the word of the Lord. I said, Lord, let your word overtake their lives concerning their disobedience. You don't have to attack people publicly. You don't even have to mention it. It's a simple word. Lord, you've already spoken on this. Let your word overtake that person, that family, whoever's doing it, that organization. Let your word overtake them. The Lord, when the, before the Lord, let's understand this, before the Lord, uh, put the world in the place, he set edicts. So as he framed the worlds, he set edicts in them. You do this, this will happen. You do that, that will happen. The power of the servants of God is simply to understand the word he gave concerning that thing and just enact it by agreeing with it. They judge themselves unworthily, Lord. So let your word begin to enact on that house. You don't have to argue with people. We don't have to say a word to them. They don't even have to know. You just enact the word. You said so. I told one of the leaders was speaking to me yesterday about uh, somebody that came disrespectfully. And I said, you, I said, the way you address that is simply just pray for me. But when you walk away, Lord, go in your Bible, find out what the word is on that situation and enact it on them. And acted on them. The Apostle Paul said, I turned Hymenaeus and Alexander, some of the coppersmith that withstood him because of the false goddess Diana in this particular city. He said, I turned them over to Satan that they may learn to fear the Lord. The point is not to destroy the person. The point is to them is to bring them to the fear of the Lord. It's redemptive. So Lord, enact your word on their life for that particular disobedience to bring them to a redemptive understanding of you. That's what we're saying. It's not to destroy you. It's to bring you to a place where you fear and tremble at the king, at his word, 
you begin to see the fear of the Lord has left the church. This is this is why we got all these preachers doing all this weird stuff. Because remember, the Lord gave it to us in his words. He said, when a person comes and they have a demon in them, okay, I'm paraphrasing because we all know the scripture, and you got a demon in you and that house is swept, so that demon is cast out. If that house is not filled, filled with what? The spirit of God, that demon will go into a dry place, search out seven more demons worse than himself, return to that house that he rightfully owns by a disobedience of the word of God. And the scripture says the last state of that man will be worse than the first. That doesn't just apply to men, that applies to nations. Whenever you put the word of God and the spirit of God out of your home, out of a nation, out of a corporate structure, a business, a government, a kingship, a queenship, whatever it is, the only other option is demonic spirits are going to come in because the world is spirit. Do we understand when the Lord framed the worlds, he did it by his pneuma? At all times, everywhere in the sovereign dominion of my father, a spirit must rule. I'm going to say it again because many of us are not understanding this. Pastors, pass it along to them. Make sure they get it. Our father spoke and the pneuma proceeded out of his mouth. That means everywhere in the worlds he framed, and Hebrews 11 and 3 tells us worlds, plural. He didn't say in the world was framed, worlds, it's plural. That means planets, solar system. The Bible mm -hmm. spoke about our world long before, come on, man understood it correctly. The Lord framed the world, and when he spoke, at all times everywhere, there is to be Numa. If Numa is not undergirding your home, your church, your business, your nation, your form of government, what your mind, your heart, the mind and heart of your organization, business leaders, whenever the Numa is not the foundation, another spirit will come in. I can't tell people on my job about Jesus, then another spirit will come in. I can't tell, uh, I, I'm the CEO, but I can't bring him in the conference room and, and put a little word up, then another spirit will enter in. So don't start whining and crying when the masses are in mass confusion and doing all this weird stuff. You allowed another spirit to come in. Now, their skill and how you introduce this, don't get me wrong, but you just can't come and cast pearl before swine. Unbelievers don't understand the Holy Ghost, but there are ways, skillful ways to introduce his presence in a place. Most of the time, unbeknownst to unbelievers. But let's not assume that all unbelievers, because the majority of them have born again family members now. The Lord has made sure of it. That's what the scripture says when it says he set the solitary in families. That means one person, at least in most families, there's one born again person. In most, not all, in most though. And in the ones that don't have them, some other family you've come into contact with had somebody. So most people, even if you don't have one in your family, you know of one that does. So, whenever there's no spirit of the Lord as the foundation, demonic spirits will enter. Because no matter where you are in the worlds that the Lord is framed, it must be upheld by spirit. This is the true meaning. This is one of the deepest revelations of the word of the Lord. When the Lord said, the hour coming now is when the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit and in truth. The truth is, wherever the spirit of God is not, the default spirit of satanic power or satanic spirits will enter that space because at all times in the worlds framed by the Lord, a spirit must uphold that area. Whether it's a region, a territory, a nation, a person, a mind, a business, 
whatever it is, there is a spirit that must uphold it, must undergird, must rule in that area. That's what Ephesians 6 is essentially telling us when it talks about rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness resting in high places. Mm -hmm. The scripture talks about principalities and powers. It is talking about the fact that whenever there's no pneuma undergirding a particular dimension or dominion. Now, why does there always have to be a spirit because of dominion. The Lord's dominion requires, you think of a kingdom with the king, wherever the king is, whatever nation he is overtaken, either by military force or tributary nature, meaning they are giving taxes or they are giving something of appeasement to that nation, he will send his messenger, he will send his um, attendants to attend over that nation. In the days of Jesus, they were called Tetrarchs, which is our governors. Herod was a Tetrarch, his brother Philip, a Tetrarch of Rome. They're governors that governed over Israel, Herod. Governors that govern over this area and over that region and over that nation by rank, by structure. Satan's kingdom has rank and structure. So does the fathers. That's what, that's what the moniker Lord of Hosts or translated in our modern English, Lord of Heaven's Armies, refers to. It refers to the Lord's kingdom has rank and file, structure, soldiers, attendants. So it requires that an attendant be at every level of authority and sovereignty of the king's kingdom. When you, as a person, as a nation, as a government, as you know, uh, 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 corporate structure, whatever it is, when you don't have the spirit of the Lord as your governing principality, you're automatically going to have a demonic one because at no time anywhere in the world's framed by the Lord, is it going to be unattended? Not going to be unattended. There's going to be a principality, some type of principality or power there, whether it's an angel, an archangel, whether it's a demonic fallen angel, there will be an attendant in the spirit realm. And in the earth realm, there will be human attendants. There will be messengers. And they are not just attendants. Make no mistake about it. They are messengers. Satan sends messengers to churches. Satan sends messengers to households to let you know we're staking our claim on your kingdom. They will war against your household till they get it. They will war against your business till they get it. They will war against your kingdom till they get it. They will war against your mind till they get it. So Bishop, how long does this last? Oh, your whole lifetime. That's why he tells us to endure hardness as good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at no time is there, does the endurance end. He doesn't say endure hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ till next week, till next Saturday, and then it ends. This battle, this war is for a lifetime. Now, this is something people don't understand. There are layers to the anointing. There are layers to... Prayer, communion with the Lord. There are layers. Why are angels sent to minister? We Many people don't understand this about their salvation. Why are angels sent to minister to men? Angels are sent to minister to us. Most people think they're talking about like Jesus in the wilderness. After he withstood the enemy, the angels came and ministered to him. And they will do that. That is part of their work. That is part of their responsibility and accountability to the kingdom. But the majority of the work that they do for the believer is the same that you see with the prophet Daniel. Oh, please hear the Holy Ghost carefully. The prophet Daniel speaks of an angel that appears to him and the angel comes and says i was uh, from the first day you prayed we heaven you're you said you're a man greatly beloved from the first day you prayed uh 
your prayer was received in heaven, meaning we begin to, the armies of heaven begin to act on what you asked us for, your request. However, on my way to you, I met another satanic power. Who was this satanic power? The next kingdom coming to overtake the one you're in right now. So he says, I was dealing with, Pastor Hudson, the Lord bless you, sir. I was dealing with this Grecian principality. Greece is a kingdom that's coming later on to overtake the Medo-Persians after they've overtaken Babylon. So this wasn't a random principality in power. This was a prophetic one because Daniel had already seen this uh, dream. The Lord showed him Nebuchadnezzar's dream of four of five world empires. He had already seen this. So this demon, this angelic Praetorian wasn't fighting against, he wasn't being held up by some random spirit. He's being held up by one that's getting ready to overtake the kingdom through succession that, that Daniel is in right now. Daniel went from the Babylonian Empire into the empire of the Medo of the Medo Persians. So this next spirit, we're getting ready to come overtake you. Now the spirit is this Grecian principality, but the Grecian principality shows up in Alexander the Great and his four generals. So the Grecian power is fighting, is trying to withhold and withstand this angelic praetorian that has descended to assist Daniel in his cause. He's being held up by this power. So you see there's a corresponding principality in the heaven to Alexander the Great and his four generals in the earth. We got to get some spiritual warfare understanding here. That when you're fighting against Satan's forces, it's not just an earthly measure. Sometimes you can't break through because there's a holdup in the heavenlies. I'm about to jump out this window. I swear I'm trying to keep the preacher on the bench. I said I was going to do my best today, Lord. There is, you're being held up sometime, not because something's going wrong here. You're checking everything. You're saying, Lord, I'm praying. I'm, I'm in your word. I'm communing. You're speaking. We're talking. It's good between us, but, but Lord, I'm not breaking through. That's because your those Praetorian angels that are trying to descend are being held up by demonic powers. The fight in the heavenlies is as real as it is down here. So what believers got to learn how to do, especially leaders, is to break the powers in the heavenlies in your region, in your nation, in your area. Thus, the prophesying of Ezekiel that I alluded to earlier, Ezekiel 37. You got to learn how to speak to principalities and powers. I shared with you all, I believe before, or it could, I do so much preaching and teaching, I don't know where I'm sharing stuff half the time. I hope it's everywhere. But I'm, you know, anyway, it's, it's always on the video. So if I didn't, you can go get it. But, but anyway, We got principalities and powers that are fighting in the heavenlies, okay? And you can you can be all set up for a breakthrough down here, and you're seeing nothing, and you're saying, what in the world is going on? Why can't I break through in this particular area? You might want to immediately start checking in the heavenlies. And I shared how... The Lord spoke to me, revival is coming to the state of Texas. And oh, if I had the time to tell you how the Lord is answering that. And the Lord spoke to me, and I prophesied this many times, revival is coming out of the state of Texas to the United States of America, to the entire nation, and then to the nations of the world. But before, and I'm sitting here thinking, well, Lord, you know, everything is set up. What in the, and we're prophesying, and Lord, you told us to prophesy. And we've done everything. And then the Lord showed me one day. He said, look, I'm talking in the spirit of the prophet. Look. And I looked into the realm of the spirit and saw a nasty 
demonstrative, oh, if I had the time to describe this principality and power, oozing all of this satanic ooze, purplish, black, greenish, just ghoulish colors. You can't even mix nothing like this on the earth. The best artists could mix this stuff I'm looking at in this demon. And I'm looking at this principality over Texas, and the Lord says, speak to it. Prophesy to it. Command it that it has to go. He's telling me this. And I begin to command as the Holy Ghost gave me utterance. And he will tell you exactly what to say. And the next thing I see, an archangel, 10 to 15 feet tall, begins to descend with Praetorian angels, lands on this platform of time. You can only see it by the delineated light beams that were delineating the different dimensions of this reality it was not like looking at the table in your house where it's solid you could only see it with the with the spiritual eyes of reception you could only tell it wasn't it wasn't uh tables of of physical solitude these were these were platforms and dimensions that were delineated by beams of light and when this archangel descended this principality immediately is expelled and not even two to three weeks later exit comes up the political measure Texit is on the ballot which will bring revival to the nation See, we were looking down here and we're saying, Lord, we did everything you told us to do. And we're not understanding why we're not seeing anything. It's because there's a principality sitting above us that has to be removed to open up the way. Now, the way is open. Come November, Texas could be declared its own separate nation from the United States of America. We opened up the way. But let me say this. Prophets under, true prophets understand one thing. This is a thankless job. You have to do what the Lord tells you to do. And please don't be looking for anybody to pat you on the back. Because most people will not understand what it is that we do. They're not going to get it because they're not in the Holy Ghost. They hear it and they're like, oh, good and well. And they're just going. This is what it means to be carnal. You know what it means to be carnal? And you will never enter the kingdom, not here or in the internal measure. If the only realm you can see is the carnal one, that means you're just, oh, Texas is just a good, you know, and everything is carnal and everything is your political leaders and everything. And there's never a measure of the realm of the spirit. You're lost. You're lost. When you die, you will be right in the lake of fire at some point. You're lost. If all you can see is the carnal measure, now, you got many Christians and even pastors teaching this. Well, you got many carnal Christians. No such thing. Our carnal Christian is a lost one. Bishop, how do we know that? Because in our, in the scriptures, the scriptures say, if we don't have the spirit of the Lord, we are none of his. If the spirit of the Lord is in you, how are you carnal? If the spirit of the Lord is in you, how can the mind of Christ not be in you? So if the mind of Christ is in you, immediately your eyes come open in the spirit. And so do your spiritual ears, your, your perception, spiritual eyes, your understanding, spiritual ears. Come open in the realm of the spirit. There is no such thing as a carnal Christian. I mean, you can say that. I, I do under, I'm not denouncing that there, uh, when I say that, I'm saying in the kingdom, there's no such thing. Kingdom citizens are endowed with the power of the Holy Ghost and his presence and the mind of Christ. It is impossible for us to continue to walk in carnality because of the progressive sanctifying measure 
by the Holy Ghost in us. Our eyes will come open to the scriptures, will come open to the spirit realm, will come open. Our ears will come open. So we can't stay. You, you start with some carnality in you, but you can't stay that way. It's impossible. The moment carnality begins to set back in on you, you are backslidden. If you die like that, you're you're in the lake. You're in the lake. If you die like that, you're in the lake. 